we see him uh, offering his son, right? Now there's a, a, a very important piece of information there which God provides for us that he didn't have at that time. At the beginning of chapter 22, he uh, got, in, in the scriptures it says, God put Abraham to the test. So they're giving us maybe the insight that everything was going to turn out okay. Well, he didn't know that, right? And it was through faith alone that he went and uh, uh, offered his son as an Olah sacrifice. One of the, uh, the five sacrifices in uh, Leviticus, which we will eventually come to, the very first uh, sac uh, sacrifice was what God was uh, asking from Abraham, right? And if you don't see the parallels between Abraham and Isaac and Yeshua going to the cross, uh, you need to go back and reread that chapter. It is powerful. It is insightful. And all the the all all the the parallels are there from from Isaac carrying the instrument of his own sacrifice to the altar from Abraham giving his only son uh, but of course Isaac was only a shadow of things that were to come right he was merely human so he would not at no point fulfill the ransom that our Messiah paid for us on that cross uh, with that we begin our teaching uh, Haye uh, Sarah which means the life of Sarah it is, uh, if you are there, it begins on Genesis chapter 23. <clears throat> chapter 23 brings closure to the life of the very first matriarch. It also uh, tells you a little of the transition that, that happens at the, at the very beginning and then later on it, uh, toward the end of the the Parsha, uh, the Torah portion, you will see uh, the handover between her and Rivka, Rebecca, who will come and take the place to fulfill and continue to uh, continue on the generations that, of the promise that God made to Abraham in earlier chapters. Um, Hebrew tradition says that it was actually because of Isaac's very traumatic experience on Mount Moriah that Sarah's health started to deteriorate. And I mean, all the mothers here in the room can probably uh, you know, assimilate to that, right? They, they can probably feel what Sarah must have been feeling. It's a 50 mile journey uh, all the way all the way to Mount Moriah. So the whole time Sarah is thinking of this son who was supposed to be the promise of the covenant that God made with Abraham being sacrificed and given to, to God. And the whole time the mother is feeling this loss of the child was the only child that came from her. So uh, it, is, it is that which Jewish tra tradition tells you that maybe that's not what caused her deteriorating health to all of a sudden uh, bring her life to an end. Uh, but of course, uh, if we go uh, to the scriptures, uh, they do something which oftentimes it, it is... Uh, it is within the, within the Bible, and that is economy of words, right? They're using very, very little words to describe it, extremely significant events. Uh, and some of them, they will use six pages to describe one, one little event, and other ones, uh, when Noah got in the ark, and uh, that, it is just a few, a few verses in the Bible which describe the flood. Uh, so, with that, Let's go to uh, chapter 23. We will begin at the, uh, 
the beginning of chapter, chapter 23, and we'll read all the way through. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. These were the years of Sarah's life. Sarah died in Kiryat Arba, also known as Hebron, in the line of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn Sarah and wept for her. When he got up from his, de from his dead one and said to the sons of Het, I am a foreigner living as an alien with you. Let me have a burial site with you so that I can bury my dead wife. The sons of Het answered Abraham, listen to us, my Lord. In this word, my Lord, as it is our custom here, we try to teach people a few Hebrew words as God says on Zephaniah 3 that he will one day restore us to a pure tongue. Mm -hmm. So we try to become a little closer to the creator by starting to maybe learn his language slowly but surely. And the words that you will see through this reading uh, one of them is Adoni, from the root word Adon, which means Lord. And then Adoni is even a higher sign of respect. Say, my Lord. It is also part of the, uh, one of the titles which we give to God, Adonai, my Lord. The, uh, the other one is, as you saw it already, the number four, Arba. That's right. And uh, Kiryat Arba, which means the city of four. So there are four places there. Uh, in the very last one is Hesed. We really don't have a, uh, in our dictionary, a word to describe the word Het. So we use CH, you know, but. Uh, uh, the uh, so hesed grace right, but it's more than that. It's it, it's that loving grace that expects nothing in return. That it is holy. That it is something that you do for somebody without expecting anything in return. That is the kind of grace that uh, this is. <clears throat> Let me see. Listen to us, Adoni. You are a prince among us. So choose any tomb to bury your dead. Not one of us will refuse his tomb for burying your dead. Abraham got up, bowed before the, before the people of the land, the sons of Heth, and spoke with them. It is, if it is your desire to help me bury my dead, then listen to me. Ask, ask Ephron, the son of Zohar to give me the cave of Machpelah which he owns the one at the at the end of his field he should sell it to me in your presence at its full value then I will have a burial site of my own Ephron the Hittite was sitting among the sons of Heth and he gave Abraham his answer in the presence of, of the sons of Heth who belonged to the ruling council of the city. No, Adoni, listen to me. I'm giving you the field with its cave. I'm giving it to you. In the presence of my people, I give it to you. <coughs> Abraham bowed before the people of the land and spoke, spoke to Ephron in their hearing. Please be good enough to listen to me. I will pay the price of the field, accept it from me, and I will bury my dead there. But Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, listen to me, a plot of land worth 400 silver shekels? What is that between me and you? Just bury your dead. Abraham got the point of what Ephron had said. So he waited out for Ephron the amount of money he had specified in the presence of, of the sons of Heth. 400 silver shekels of the weight accepted among the merchants, about 10 pounds. Thus, the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which is, not, which is by Mamre, 
the field, its cave, and all the trees in and around it were deeded to Abraham as his possession in the presence of the sons of Ted, who belonged to the ruling council of the city. Then Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave in the field of Machpelah by Mamre, also known as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and its cave has been purchased by Abraham from the sons of Heth as a, as a burial site which would belong to him. <coughs> a very interesting thing that just pops up immediately while reading this, this chapter, is the number of times that the B'nai Heth, that the sons of Heth is mentioned in the chapter. Ten times. This, if you don't believe that my father is the God of detail, then reread your Bible. That's right. Amen. And, and that is the number 10 is the number of completion, is the number of his authority over us. It, 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 in order for things to be complete, in order for things to come to fruition, they must. It, it, Oftentimes, uh, as you will see continuously, you will see that every uh, every number has a meaning. Every number has something, a, a whole story behind it. Well, it is that which we see here immediately for uh, for the author to take the time to mention the sons of ten, ten times to ensure that the land uh, would belong to. Abraham for all generations to come, right? As we see in the scripture, there are three places of which the scripture testifies and serves as a witness that the Israelite people bought that land and they own it to this day. But unfortunately, because of our political situations, it, I pray to God that our judgment will not be so severe, but I am sure we will answer for our us taking place in forcing Israel to give up that land of Machpelah to now be enemies of Israel. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Can't even go visit it. No, and that is uh, unfortunately one of those uh, things that we will have to eventually answer to. Uh, so Abraham bought the cave at the full price, right? This day and age of where everybody wants something free and something at a discount. There's a lot of wisdom here. A lot of wisdom that tells you, no. If you, if you accept it as a gift, if you accept it uh, at a discounted price, then future generations will, may come to contest it, right? What we are seeing here is Middle Eastern custom, right? Exactly. They are, a, a piece of land is part of their inheritance. And those people, their generations have been there for thousands of years in the same place. Having spent a, uh, much time in the Middle East, I found myself living among them quite a bit and figure out how each one of those people in um, places like Iraq, they can identify themselves with 29 tribes. Mm -hmm. All the people there know their uh, their roots down to those 29 tribes. Yeah. So a piece of land is an extremely important thing, right? Uh, did Abraham have to do this? Did he have to <laughs> bow to the people of the land? No. No. If you read the chapters, that land already belonged to him, right? God had already given him that land. He was showing respect. That's right. Uh, that promise which God had made would not come to fruition for another uh, five to six hundred years or so, right? But he was showing respect for the people of the land. He was also showing that he was willing to accept whatever price they put on that piece of land. Yeah. And as a foreigner, owning a little tiny piece of land in someone else's uh, property, I mean, that's that was a big deal. Very true. Yeah. Exactly, and he needed to make sure 
that it would not be contested with, unfortunately. Mm. That, with the other two places mentioned in the Bible, are three of the most contested places in the Middle East. And it is sad, but that is, uh, in those people contesting those places, they know. They know exactly what they're doing, and they yeah. know the meaning behind those places. We work safe. Absolutely, yeah. And the adversary will always tell you, right? As Yeshua paid full price for our ransom, when he hung on that cross, it is, it is that which also, as Revelations uh, ten twelve tells you, the enemy will contest your, your salvation. He will question your identity to the Messiah. He will do it over and over. But fear not. It, yeah, as, as stated in 1 Corinthians 6.20, um, you were already bought at a price. It is, it, is, yes. it is a done deal. It is sealed and not to be contested. Uh, but um, uh, so with with that with that in mind, um, I'd like to speed up and go to chapter twenty four. Now, chapter twenty four is a little lengthy, so I ask you to bear with me. <coughs> now begin. By now, Abraham was old, advanced in years. And Adonai had blessed Abraham in everything. Abraham said to, to the servant who had served him the longest, who was in charge of all he owned, put your hand under my thigh, because I want you to swear to Adonai, God of heaven and God of the earth, that you will not choose a wife for my son from among the women in Canaan, of the Canaanites, among whom I am living, but that you will go to my homeland to my kinsmen to choose a wife for my son uh, Gitzai, Isaac. The servant replied, suppose the woman isn't willing to follow me to this land. Must I then bring your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, see to it that you don't bring my son back there. I don't know the God of heaven who took me away from my father's house and away from the land I was born in who spoke to me and swore to me, I will give this land to your descendants. He will send his angel ahead of you. And you are to bring a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is unwilling to follow you, then you are released from your obligation of my own. You just don't bring my son back there. The servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning the matter. Then the servant took ten of his ten of his uh, of his master's camels and all kinds of gifts from his master. Got up and went to Aram Naharaim, to Nahor city. Uh, toward evening, when he when the women go out to draw water. He had the camels kneel down outside the city by the well. He said, Adonai, God of my master Abraham, please uh, let me succeed today and show your grace to my, uh, your has said to my master Abraham. Here I am, here I am standing by the, by the spring as the daughters of the town come to draw water. I will say, I will say to one of the girls, please lower your jug so that I can drink. If she answers, yes, drink, and I will water your camels as well. Then let her be the one who int you intend for your servant Yitzhak. This is how I will know that you have shown his said to my master. Before, before he had finished speaking, Rivka, Rebecca, the daughter of Betuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her jug on her shoulder. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin, never, never having had sexual relations with any man. She went down to the spring 
filled her jug and came up. The servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a sip of water from your jug to drink. Drink, my lord, uh, she replied, and immediately lowered her jug onto her arm and let him drink. When she she was when he was when she was through letting him drink, she said, I will also <coughs> draw water for your camels until they have drunk their fill. She quickly emptied the jug into a trough. Then ran again to the well to draw water and kept on drawing water for all his camels. <clears throat> the man gazed at her in silence, waiting to find out whether Adonai had made his trip successful or not. <clears throat> uh, yeah. When the camels were done drinking, the man took a gold nose ring weighing one fifth of an ounce, about half a shekel, and two gold bracelets weighing four ounces and asked, whose daughter are you? Tell me, please. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered, I am the daughter of Betuel, the son of the son of Milcah, born, the son Milcah born to Nahor. Adding, we have plenty of straw and fodder and room for staying overnight. The man bowed his head and prostrated himself before Adonai. Then he said, Blessed be Adonai, God of our master, Abraham, who has not abandoned his faithful love for my master, because Adonai has guided me to the house of my master's kinsman. kinsman. <coughs> the girl ran off and told her mother, her mother's household, what had happened. Rivka had a brother named Laban, Laban. <coughs> when he saw the nose ring, Yes, I know this ring. <laughs> and the bracelet on his sister's wrist besides. <laughs> and when he heard his sister Rivka report of what the man had said to her, he ran out uh, to the spring and found the man standing there by the, by the camels. Come on in, he said. You whom Adonai has blessed, why are you standing outside when I have made room in the house and prepare a place for your camels? So the man went inside, and while the cows were being unloaded and provided straw and water, uh, and water, uh, uh, water was brought to him to wash his feet and the feet of, of the men with him. But when a meal was set before him, he said, I won't eat until I say what I have to say. Levon said, speak. He said, I am Abraham's servant. I don't know has greatly blessed my master, so that he has grown wealthy. He has given him flocks, herds, silver, gold, male and female slaves, camels, donkeys. Sarah, uh, Sarah, my master's wife, bore my master's my master a son uh, when she was old, and he was given, and he has given him everything he has. Uh, my master made me swear, saying, "You are not to choose a wife from." for my son from among the women of the Canaanites, uh, among whom I am living. Brother, you are to go to, to my father's house, to my kinsmen, to choose a wife for my son. I said to my master, suppose the woman isn't willing to follow. <clears throat> Abraham answered me, Adonai, in whose presence I live, will send his angel with you to make, to make your trip successful. And you are to pick a wife for my son from my kinsmen in my father's house. This will release you from your obligation under my oath. But if when you come to my kinsmen, they refuse to give her to you, uh, this too will release you from, from my oath. So today I came to, to the spring and said, Adonai, God of my master Abraham, if you are causing my trip to succeed, in his purpose, then here I am, standing by the spring. I will say to to the one to one of the girls coming out of, out to draw water, let me have a sip of water from your jug. If she answers, yes, drink, and I will water your camels as well, then let her be the woman you intend for my for my master's son. And even before I had finished speaking to my to my heart, there came Rivka. Going out 
with her jug on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water. Then I said to her, please, let me have a drink. She immediately lowered the jug from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will water your camels as well. So I drank, and she, she had the camels drink too. I asked her, whose daughter are you? And she answered, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, whom Milcah bore, <coughs> bore him a son. Then I put the ring on her, on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. Bowed my head, prostrated myself before Adonai, and blessed Adonai, God of my master Abraham, for having led me in the right way to obtain my master's brother's granddaughter for his son. So now, if you people intend to show grace and truth to my master, tell me. But if not, tell me so that I can turn elsewhere. Levan and Betuel replied, since this comes from Adonai, we can't say anything to you, either bad or good. Rivka is here in front of you. Take her and go. Let her, let it be your master's son's wife. As Adonai has said, when Abraham's servant heard what they said, he prostrated himself on the ground to Adonai. Then the servant brought out silver, gold jewelry, together with clothing and gave them to Rivka. He also gave valuable gifts to her brother and mother. He and his men then ate and drank and spent the night. In the morning, he got up. He said, send me off to my master. Her brother and mother said, let the girl stay with us, with us a few days, at least 10. After that, she will go. He answered them, don't delay me, since Adonai has made my trip successful, but let me go back to my master. They said, we will call the girl and see what she says. They called Rebka and asked her, will you go with, with this man? And she replied, I will. So they sent their sister Rebka away with her nurse. Abraham's servant and his men, <clears throat> they blessed Rebka with these words. Our sister, may you be the mother of millions, and may your descendants possess the cities of those who hate them. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Then Ribka and her maids mounted the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Ribka and went on his way. Meanwhile, Yitzhak, one evening after coming along the road from Be'er uh, Lahai Roi, he was living in Negev, when, when out walking in the field, and as he looked up, he saw cattle approaching. Rebka too looked up, and when they, they saw Yitzhak, she quickly dismounted the cattle. She said to the servant, who is this man walking in the field to meet us? When the servant replied, it's my master. She took her veil and covered, uh, and covered herself. The servants told Yitzhak everything he had done. Then Yitzhak brought, brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rivka. And she became, became his wife, and he loved her. Thus was Yitzhak comforted for the loss of his mother. Okay, so this chapter here, again, did it go? There it is for now. Oh. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> so, as Abra Abraham approaches the end of his life, he realizes that he may not be there for much longer. Mm -hmm. So he takes his most trusted servant, <clears throat> who we can only assume is Eleazar of Damascus. Yes. As is mentioned previous chapters here, uh, it makes him take a note, right? And at that time, uh, we only find this uh, very unusual custom of uh, the hand on the thigh once more when uh, Jacob makes Joseph uh, do, do the same, uh, take the same oath. Uh, but uh, nowhere else do we see this. Uh, but it is, uh, 
in my research, I found out that it is because of your, um, that's where your descendants will, will be coming from, right? That's where the nations will be. So it is one of those that may my descendants be cursed if I do not fulfill this, this oath I am making to you. The importance of that oath is what will fulfill the, the promise that God has made with Abraham. So this is important. And Abraham understands this. Yeah. It, um, uh, so Elie Eliezer of Damascus. Uh, let me see. Do I have it here? All right. So his his travels took him about four hundred miles from from where he was living in Kiryat Arba all the way to just past uh, Raqqa, which is like right around here, all the way to wow. there. And that was, I mean, that's even a long journey on paved roads in a car. Can you so, imagine by camp? Yeah, exactly. But now, uh, Abraham... But you're only going to ride one. Uh, one of, the, <laughs> one of the, the things that we notice is the maturity and faith which Abraham has developed, which it takes a long time, right? Uh, at the very beginning, we see him lying about his wife, you know, doubting the promise that God has made him. But as time continues, he starts trusting more to the point where now at the end of his life, he is actually 100% certain that God will send a melech, yes. a, a angel, I guess, as, well, as we translate it, right? A messenger. Yeah, there are probably about seven different, uh, what we call angels, I guess. We, we usually just translate a bunch, bunch of them all up into angels. But there's some, some uh, angels that have a very specific purpose, right? The, the ones that sit at the right by the throne of, of God, you know, who kneel down with their eyes covered uh, in um, uh, the Caribbean. And, and then this one is a melech, a messenger that will go forward, right? Yes. Uh, and Abraham is certain that this will happen. The only one who doubts is the servant. The servant is terrified of this because he has no idea. But the whole time he is praying, right? Being next to his master, he observes the, the, the blessings that God has provided for Abraham, and he knows. He has seen this coming to fruition yes. so far. So he understands uh, and knows uh, the God of Abraham. As a matter of fact, in the uh, original Hebrew text, you, uh, you read Eleazar, Eleazar referencing God by his name, not by the title, actually, he says, yod he bad he on, on, on there. It, you know, so, so he knows God, and he understands um, how the, it will come to fruition, but he just doesn't know. As he makes his travel 400 miles all the way to the north, he ends up in the very town, in the very well, where uh, Betuel's daughter was coming over there. I said it was the <coughs> custom, and it is the custom still in some, uh, in certain places where the the young uh, females. It is part of their daily chores to go over there and draw the water and bring it to, to the house. Uh, he goes to the very wall where she goes to draw the water for the family. So what are the chances that Abraham told him, okay, I want you to go to my kinsman, and that is exactly what Abraham was thinking, and then God puts him right there on that same very well at that time when she was coming, right? Uh, yeah, so Ripka is... And the GPS, God positioned. That's right, without GPS, without... God answered right on time. His, right on his time. His prayer was not even over with... Right on time. Uh, I mean, all he had, the only thing that he was missing was to say, God, please uh, give me a, a woman whose name will be... Rebecca. I mean, it, but yeah, the, when she just comes up to him and, and then he still kind of doubts, he's looking into it. Could this be the one? It's like, how much more of her do you need? You know, it's, I think it is, that strengthened his faith. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, it, 
oftentimes, that's what happens to us in prayer. Amen. The prayer gets answered, but we're like, okay, wait, wait, wait that, that's not quite what we were thinking. You know, but no, it, it, it does. It does. Yeah. Right on time. And uh, yeah, so Rebecca, being the uh, granddaughter of Nahor, which is Abraham's brother, uh, Bethuel being Abraham's cousin, or I'm sorry, nephew, uh, Rebecca being, or Bethuel being cousins with Isaac, Isaac being second cousins with Rebecca. So they are, they are related, but kind of distant, distant. right? They're not, yeah. <laughs> distant, distant, distant. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> yeah, but uh, also another thing that's very interesting to know is how uh, the servant, Abraham's servant, kind of changes his story a little after he gets the feeling for this family. Abraham gives him a task and makes him swear an oath. And notice uh, the story is retold about four times. Mm -hmm. In every time that he tells, retells the story, depending on who he's telling it, it kind of changes the order a bit, you know. And sometimes he had something that is different, not because he has a bad memory, but because he is actually seeing, he sees Rebecca come down, and in in a place where it doesn't seem like everybody is very kind, in every. Uh, Notice that the interest that the brother immediately uh, displays by seeing the, the jury. And he's like, oh, what do we got here? Riches. So immediately he sees Rebecca and tells her the story because she sees the one person doing kindness where, when everyone else is not. So Without compensation. Without compensation, absolutely. And that is what he notices. So he tells her the story as it was... Uh, ordered by Abraham, and then when he goes to her family, the story kind of changes a little bit. It, it begins a story with, uh, my master Abraham is very rich and very wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, so he, he is ensuring that his, his um, although God has already made his, his trip successful, he is ensuring that they will give her to him as uh, um, Yitzhak's bride. And not just love the way this, this chapter ends. Uh, and he loved her. Thus was Isaac comforted for the loss of his mother. That um, it, is, it is just such a powerful statement to finish this verse. Um, but we also see the, uh, the beginning of which we still practice to this day with a veil, right? Uh, it was, I mean, it was not a, a normal custom for women to wear a veil over their faces. But it is uh, what we still do to this day when you, she was assuming the role of the bride. Uh, the very role that we should be uh, assuming with Yeshua mm -hmm. as the bride, right? Willing to travel. She was willing to, to go with him to where she was told uh, to go. And it is that in which, in faith, we need to, again, take the step, the leap of faith, and continue doing that. And get yourself ready, because he is coming. Amen. 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 I thought it was really interesting that the title of this is actually the journey of Sarah. And, it's, and what we see in the scripture there is it's her death and her burial. But really and truly, when you think about it, by uh, Rita coming on the scene there, that is the journey of Sarah. Because it doesn't end with one matron. It, it continues with another one. Yes. And God always makes a way. Yes, he yeah. always does. And another interesting thing here in, in this scripture, and I think uh, Jackie Howard brought this to my attention several years ago. This is the only place in the Bible where Abraham made a purchase of land. There is no other place in the Bible. There's only one other instance where there's land bought. Well, there are two other instances. Two uh, one in uh, 2 Corinthians, where David bought the, the land for the holy temple. Okay, and right? For 600 pieces of gold. 
And then there is uh, in chapter 33 of Genesis where Jacob buys the burial place for Joseph. And he paid 100 uh, casita. So I feel this is the only place, in, place yeah. where Abraham bought any land. Oh, yeah, absolutely. These were also to be his last recorded words in the Bible. Uh, but yeah, those three places, the scriptures um, are a testament of proof that they belong to the Israelites. Yes. Mm-hmm. And those are extremely contested, contested places to this day. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's, that was, I, I believe that that is part of the reason why they mentioned it 10 times in, the, in that Oh, yeah. in that chapter to make sure that it was there was no doubt in anyone's mind that that land belonged to Abraham and where all the patriarchs would, would one day sleep in the, in the dust mm-hmm. awaiting resurrection <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, there, there's a word here in okay. verse 17 and it's in verse 17 that says thus the field of Ephraim in Marquina ah. which is by memory the field and its caves and all the fish around it were deed yeah. So not only is this the title of deed of their land, there's also in the ancient times there was a deed recorded in front of the officials of the city. So there was a legal transaction that was, you know, Absolutely. so you have to re- uh, recognize that he's purchasing from the from the sons of Canaan. Mm-hmm. And and when the land was divided at the at the time after the flood, that land was supposed to be for the the sons of Shem, and it, based on being empty and whatnot, the sons of Canaan kind of took possession of it. Yet here's uh, uh, God's this, uh, God's providence and God's chosen people being singled out to inherit this land, where He's going to choose later on to put His name upon it. And here is His His chosen people, His chosen descendants, actually purchasing it. For a full yeah. price, but so documents by men will be lost, mm-hmm. and they will disintegrate and evaporate into nothing. His word has endured the test of time, Amen. and it remains true, in one hundred percent accurate. Every document that we find that predates Yeshua by centuries and centuries proves to be exactly accurate as well, which is the reason why. It was yeah to be sure that to end here and, and remain here and be recorded within these pages, so that there would be well, no doubt in anyone's mind that it belonged to them. Uh, yeah, but that's um that is my Torah teaching for today. Uh, chapter twenty five goes on to the burial of Abraham, which it would be in Machpelah, and then one of the, uh, his concubines, which he took. Katura uh, bore him six sons. One of them, well, or some of them, which you will never hear about in, in the Bible again. But some of them, uh, like Midian, for example, as he pushed them to the east, he went over there and settled in the land which uh, in this day and age would be known as Saudi Arabia. Right? And uh, he took that land the land which would later on serve for the refuge for uh, Moses fleeing Egypt, and then later on for the Exodus to take his people to that land which he already knew. So God is already setting the path here for Moses to have a place to go after he flees Egypt. It's impressive how all that works. Uh, Any questions? Yes, please. discussing this the other day because we were reading this together like you know he's saying the God of Abraham yeah. but then when you read where did Abraham come from Abraham if you if you trust the book of Jubilees and Jasher Abraham spent relatively little time in his father's city city of Ur and 
when he came out, you know, he took servants and things with him. So the, the consensus we kind of came to is that a lot of these servants would have been idolaters and you know, people who worship other gods. Um, in Ur, while, Shem, while Abraham was living and training under Noah and Shem elsewhere, you know, learning to walk in you know, the commandments of God, learning who Adonai was. And you know, so he takes these people with him. And so very literally, they would have understood, even if they took on this God for themselves, they would have understood this to be the God of Abraham because he was their introduction to this God. So very literally, he was you know, the God of Abraham. Uh, from, so a that was just kind of from a historical perspective, the book of Jasher reports Eliezer mm -hmm. being a gift from Nimrod after he was uh, saved from the burning furnace and whatnot. Oh, so okay. Very interesting yep. story there, but this, it, we use it for historical, not it, spiritual. Yeah, absolutely. And it is not rare. I mean, if you look at Laban, uh, later on we will find out that he is just courteous. By saying, "Oh, you're, you know, the God, you know, you whom Adonai has blessed," he's just addressing him by his God. But he has many gods, so he was just trying to be courteous, to be honest with you. So okay, that that is something that we'll just, you know, I guess we will see all the way through, all the way through the Book of Exodus, Leviticus. But, yes, ma'am. Well, I think that's the first thing. Oh, absolutely. We can definitely have. Actually, if you give me my, your email, I can just uh, give you access to those and then you can download them. We, I think we have a copy of her email. Oh. Huh? We got a copy of her email from the visitation thing. Today. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, with that, um, we, we sent for the kids the game doesn't let them go yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> so keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> descendants of Abraham, but he set the stage up for the median I uh, will come into the picture later in the story. Uh, some of those brothers will pester the Israelites as they are coming back uh, through the desert. So, and, it's, and it's interesting to see how uh, the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, and all those other sort of cousins pester each other and fight each other throughout the, 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 the coming century. Yeah. To this day, yeah. because uh, although the uh, Palestinians identify themselves as, as sort of Ishmaelites, Arabs, uh, yeah. they, it's proven genetically throughout history that they are Edomites from from, uh, from Esau. Yeah, it, I mean the, the term Arab didn't even was not even the picture until you know about uh, 400 BCE. You know, so